Thanks, Adam. So what I'm going to talk about today is placement and control of energy storage in the grid. And uh, so essentially what I'm going to try to do is, so I work on optimization control and game theory of power systems. So what I'm going to try to do is sort of show one of the grid issues that I'm interested in, which is integration of storage um, technologies. And how I'm going to show is the, the interaction of data and sort of theory. So I'm a theorist. I try to prove theorems. So I, I'll try to show you how uh, it, it actually goes both ways. Okay. So proceeding, essentially, Storage comes in different shapes, sizes, modalities, and efficiencies, and whatnot, right? But if you are trying to do sort of integration studies, then there are two different objectives that you can uh, try to look at. One is, suppose if I own some generation, if I own some storage technologies, and I'm plugged into some particular port in the uh, particular bus in a, in a in a in an electricity grid. Then what would I do? I would try to maximize my profit by looking at what the prices are. So, right? so that is essentially what is, essentially, if I am a storage owner or operator's perspective. But I can take a different objective by looking at uh, being a system operator. Like if I am an independent system, oper uh, system operator like the ISOs, I can do, uh, I can use the storage as a communal asset and try to optimize some network-wise objective, something like, let's say, minimizing the generation cost or dispatch cost and whatnot, right? So gen uh, storage generally has more than uh, you know, one use that we can think of. There have been many studies of possible uses of storage technologies. What I'm going to focus on are the two different ones. Uh, one is over hours, you can look at this long time scale uh, problem of load shifting. I think we mentioned at some point that if, if your sort of generation costs are convex, then if you, if you do not have to follow the load and you can generate on a flatter basis, then it's beneficial. Right? So that is one problem I'm going to look at in a deterministic setting. And the other one is if you had access to a storage that can f ramp fast, right? then what you can do is you can counter intermittency of any sort of stochastic uh, generation resource that you have. So in both these studies, what I'm going to focus on is how to uh, place them or cite them, and then how to size them, and then, of course, subject to that, optimally controlling them after that. right? So essentially, I'm looking at the question of control. But on top of it, I want to do the investment decision. That is where to place and size. All right. So without further ado, what I'm going to show in, in, uh, in this, in this uh, talk is that uh, we came up with, from some simulations, we came up with a nice sort of Q theorem about displacement results in this uh, long time scale. And in the short time scale, our theory actually gives rise to a structure that we are interested in calculating. but Empirically, doing that study without the result would be very hard, but using this, uh, this theoretical result, it's quite easy to characterize if you have access to data. So we'll, we'll show this interaction. All right. So my first bit is on optimal placement of storage in the context of load shifting. So let's look at a very simple example. So suppose there is a, just a two-node network, right? In the first one, there is some generator, let's say some diesel generator, which has a convex cost of generation, and there is a demand profile that goes over time. Now, if I had no storage at all, what would I do? I have to generate exactly to follow this demand profile, right? But if the, uh, the costs are convex, it's fairly easy to see that flatter the generation, lower the cost, as I said before, right? So now I have these two, uh, two storage already there at two different places with capacities B1 and B2. Then if I have to figure out what the generation schedule is, it's an optimal control problem. Right? given that I know exactly what the demand profile is. But now suppose I do one step <laughs> further, that is I have some access to some storage budget H, and I want to do the optimal placement as well. So my capacities become decision variables. Right? So now what we did is with this formulation, this is of course a two node network, what we did is we went ahead and took the IEEE uh, data sets uh, of like mock transmission networks, and used demand profiles that we got from Southern California Edison from their feeders. And uh, for the network model, we used a conic relaxation of the AC power flow model. Right? And we just solved it, just to see what happens. Okay? Where does it place? And can we say something about b by looking at the network structure? So purely empirical study. Right? And then we, again, uh, changed a little bit and changed this first generator by, and replaced by the NREL's wind data set, and then wanted to see what happens to the placement. So the question is, where does it place? <laughs> and 
surprisingly, whenever we ran, this is one of the results. So x-axis is the bus number, and this is how much storage you put at each individual bus, right? So uh, these numbers, without even going through something, we notice that one and two, these two buses always get zero storage capacity. And what are buses one and two? The cheap, two cheapest generators. So we were a little surprised because you, know, you don't usually think that you would have no storage at the generation. So we tried to prove this using this framework. It turns out with the AC relaxation, which is essentially using a semi-definite program, it's quite hard to analyze this problem. So we simplified it and went back to our two-node model. Right? So we now again try to understand if I am given a demand profile and a convex generation cost, uh, and given some H and some line capacity F, can I prove anything about the placement, where it would place? Can I say something about, at optimality, what happens to B1 and B2? It turns out we could prove this, that B1 star, that is, there is an optimal allocation in which you don't need any, uh, any storage capacity at the generator. And this holds, so initially we linearized and did this with the DC model, uh, with the lossless model, and we again uh, could generalize our proof techniques for even when the losses are modeled. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the details, but so now we try to push this beyond the two node networks, of course, because you know uh, that's not a very realistic uh, depiction of what a power system looks like. So we have a little bit of a story. We, uh, it gives a partial answer that is any generator node that links to the rest of the the network with one link, you can say the same thing, but with multiple ones, it is not true. Uh, that is, we have a counterexample to show that it, uh, it, it's not always the case that you don't need any generator. So it provides a partial answer, not a full answer. But remember that this is quite a general theorem, right? Irrespective of the demand profile. I don't care what demand profiles you give me. Irrespective of the line capacity, it holds. But of course, uh, um, our hope would be to see what happens if you can restrict these demand profiles to certain classes. All right, any questions so far? Then I will move on to my next bit, where now we look at a little, slightly different problem, right? So there we were looking at bulk storage, la uh, large-scale storage devices over hours, we, and we took a deterministic demand profile, like as if we knew the demand. But that is more or less a realistic assumption if you're looking at very large-scale uh, and averaged over time. But if you're looking at very fast time scale, which is like, let's say, minutes, uh, well, you shouldn't go to seconds because then it's an automatic generation control as what en Enrique was talking about. That's a little different domain that we don't want to get into. But this is uh, at still uh, the faster time scale at around three to five minutes time scales. Then you will run into, you know, a cloud cover runs over the sun and then your solar output drops immediately. Now what do you do? In such cases, is it optimal to cite the way we did before, right? So to study that, uh, we came up with a different sort of a framework, so let me talk to you about that. So consider this very, very simple model, where we have at a bus i, we have three things going on. One is the cik, so the superscript i is the bus number, k is the time, so time is discretized in this model. So what is cik? It is any net, uh, sorry, firm demand minus any stochastic supply. So essentially, we, we call it the net demand. Right? This is the stochastic quantity in, a, in the system. So think of if you have a wind generator or solar uh, PV output, negative of that output is essentially this. Right? Now, the system operator has also access to some dispatchable generation or load resource at every node. So essentially the idea is that uh, if VIK is positive, it's a, it's a generation. If it's negative, it's a dispatchable load. Uh, and then UIK is what you inject or extract from the storage. Of course, there is some storage capacity, so we assume some linear dynamics of the storage systems, right? So now, what is exactly going on? So at time k, what do I do? I essentially, so in, in the language of stochastic control, you can formulate the problem, but essentially, what are we doing? At every time k, we observe the, the, the net demand that we have to satisfy across the network. By the way, this is a, this is a spatio temporal random process, right? So across all buses, across all times. Uh, so this is at time k, c, i, k, we observe that. We know exactly where we stand with our storage systems. And then we decide on how much we are going to charge or discharge next. 
and also how much we're going to dis uh, dispatch at that point, right? So that dispatch obviously costs you something. Otherwise, the problems would be trivial, right? Uh, so the cost associated, we take it to be of the following nature, which is piecewise linear, where alpha i you can think of as the marginal cost of generation. And the beta i is the marginal cost of consumption. Sorry, marginal utility of consumption, right? So we take these two two-part form. So essentially, what have we done so far? We have said how the vi's would cost. So now we can formulate, you know, the expected cost of dispatch. That is, you you have the, your dispatch variables at every time k. Just add the costs up uh, across all nodes, and then take a summation over all post, all all the uh, across time. Right? And then take an expectation over all possible realizations of your net demand process, C. Right? So that's your expected cost of dispatch. And in any sort of a control framework, what we are interested in is minimizing this dispatch cost. So this is a very, very classical multi-period multi uh, economic dispatch problem. Right? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So essentially, now with J star B is what is uh, the, the dispatch cost with B. So what we can do is you can show a very simple relationship, as you might expect. As you increase your storage, the minimum expected cost decreases, right? So that is not increasing. And also, you can show that it's convex. That's also not very hard to show. But what, what matters is when it's convex, observe that the greatest marginal value, that is, if I had access to a little bit of storage, where would it be most efficient? It is at the origin, right? So essentially. If we could characterize how much is the marginal value at origin, what we have access to is we know exactly how much value we gain out of initial investments. right? And if I have access to that for each and every node, the one that has the highest marginal value is the place to optimally place that initial investment. right? So now, essentially, I'll give you a basic idea how we characterize this through data. right? So now, what do we do? We get CK. And we have to dispatch VK and UK, which are the, the, the dispatch plus the, the storage uh, decision variable, right? Now, do the following problem. Consider a problem with uh, the single period economic dispatch with CK with no storage. Suppose you had access to no storage. Then find out the electricity price at a particular node, which is essentially a dual multiplier, right? Now, what you do is you can characterize the following theorem where this marginal value is upper bounded by, uh, rather than getting into the notation, it is the optimal price arbitrage with these shadow prices. What do I mean by that? So the prices vary as a function of time, right? Suppose I could do arbitrage with these prices. That is, I can buy and sell. What would you do? You would buy at the, the valley and uh, sell at the peak, right? So essentially, the amount that you make from an optimal uh, arbitrage is and the expected value over all possible net demand process is what is uh, uh, providing an upper bound for this. And moreover, equality holds under certain technical conditions where the costs are homogeneous across the network and the network is acyclic. Okay? So let me just quickly go through. This is, this is one example, and it should be, uh, sorry, Adam, just one minute for this. Uh, so the idea is fairly simple. I'm sorry. <laughs> So let's take a very simple example and let me show you how data can help us, right? Now I take a, a, an example where the costs are equal on both nodes, right? Now what, I, what it happens is for every node, these prices at different regions of the C space are different and it corresponds to exactly alpha and beta. Now what you do is you take your demand process, if you have access to the data of the demand process, all you do is you plot them and then what is the optimal arbitrage? where you buy at beta and you sell at alpha. So all you have to take care of is where it goes from this region to this region, right? So essentially, if you can estimate the number of crossovers, which is three in this, you can, you can get it from data. By getting data, you just plot it and count the average number of such crossovers, right? And now these regions would be different for different nodes, and that would give you essentially the marginal, uh, an upper bound on the marginal values of storage. So uh, we are in the process of using the annual wind data and on the IEEE networks we want to measure how much these, are, uh, these marginal values are to decide how to, uh, where to optimally place them. Thank you. These are my collaborators.
<laughs> I thought I had the least mathematics. Come on. <laughs>